All right, you're on. We see your slides. Thank you guys for having me. Today we're going to um, talk about various different implant materials, um, but really we're going to focus on biomimetic titanium um, and, and particularly the, the technology that Spine Art has, um, has kind of revolutionized. Um, and we're going to present two clinical studies um, that we did uh, supporting kind of this technology and we'll kind of go through what we found. These are my disclosures. The only thing that's kind of significant to this is that I do uh, do consulting with uh, spine art. So, um, you know, there's various implant materials in spine surgery, everything from allograft um, to titanium, to porous, to acid etch, to laser engraved, to peak, um, HA coated. Uh, and really, we've been kind of searching for the holy grail of implant material for a long time. And it was assumed that we found this with PEAK, um, given its kind of low modulus of elasticity and its kind of so-called ability to see the fusion um, on x-ray, which I think we can kind of debate that as well. Um, but more recently, I think there's a lot of us that have moved away from PEAK, given its hydrophobic and uh, apoptotic properties. Um, uh, uh, on a cellular level. Um, I still think that peak is probably 50% or more of the implant market. Um, I think more at the education centers, a lot of people have been moving more toward titanium. Um, you know, the, the benefits of titanium and porous surface technology um, in terms of osseo integration is not new, right? This has been around for a long time, particularly in orthopedics. Um, We've used porous titanium for total hip arthroplasty for about 30 years. Uh, and uh, it's been used even longer in dentistry. So when I actually looked to kind of see who used the first porous titanium, um, dentists were using it for implants like 50 years ago. Um, again, to get these implants, these tooth implants to fuse into the mandible. Um, and when we look at um, our experience with total hip arthroplasty um, and these porous cups, you can see that the survivorship for the acetabular component at 10 years is nearly 100%. And things are much better today, right? We know that uh, you know, the, 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 at, at 15 or 20 years, these numbers are kind of consistent to what we see today. Um, I wanna sidetrack for a minute and make an important difference, which I see at the meetings all the time and confused particularly with industry and the sales representatives in industry. Um, and sometimes even in journals um, and in everyday conversations, um, 3D printing is an additive manufacturing process from a CAD, right? Computer-aided design. Um, porous trabecular biomimetic metal is a different type of um, technology that may be designed to stimulate both bony on growth and in growth. Can a 3D printer you be used to produce something that is biomimetic? Absolutely, like something at the top here. Um, but at the same time, you can use a 3D printer to pr print uh, essentially anything that doesn't necessarily mean that we're talking about surface technology or bi biomimetic technology. Um, Tie Life is a technology that was developed by Spine Art, which is a 3D printed porous metal design that is biomimetic and hopes to enhance early and robust osseo integration. And when we look at the structure of trabecular bone, we can see that the pore diameter is usually somewhere around four to 600 micrometers and the porosity is about 80%. Um, and when they design the tie life structure, um, they try to design it similarly. So pore diameter again, six to 700 microns and um, overall porosity around 75%. Um, you know, one of the beauties of peak was that its modulus of elasticity was somewhere between cancellous bone and cortical bone, but much closer to cancellous bone. And subsidence, we think, has a lot to do with um, the, um, 
the modulus of elasticity and that difference between trabecular bone and the implant itself. Modulus, um, is, is, as we know, is the slope of the stress strain curve, um, but it could also play a role in something called mechanotransduction, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, the things that we really also need to know is that, uh, and realize is that modulus is not everything, right? So um, some of the failures of, of um, the porous implants that we've seen in the literature, um, uh, some of the early tritanium cages, um, the, the tantalum cages, so tantalum cages were used in ACDFs and, and a couple of trials for anterior cervical fusion. And what happened with those was because they didn't provide enough compressive strength, there was an increased risk, risk of catastrophic failure. So at the same time as we want to, um, we want to have the optimum modulus, we need to make sure that there is enough compressive strength to prevent um, catastrophic failure. And what you can see here is that um, even though that the modulus is very close to peak, um, the compression strength is, is, uh, is relatively strong, about 10 times stronger. So um, the, the kind of the basis of the talk that I wanted to give to you guys today is um, an overview of two of the studies that we did surrounding Thai life itself. Um, and these studies, again, are using Thai life specific technology but likely the data can be extrapolated for any biomimetic um, trabecular type of metal. Now, um, these studies again were used specific with fine arts technology, but um, as you'll kind of see as we get through, I think really the idea is trabecular biomimetic metal versus 2D titanium, traditional titanium versus peak. Um, and what we wanted to do was have a comprehensive robust analysis of this both in vitro and in vivo to see if um, our hypotheses uh, were correct. So there are two studies that were performed in 2019. One was an in vitro study um, and the second study was an animal study in sheep. So on a cellular and chemical level, how does the structure of Thai life uh, alone affect osteoprogenitor cells, right? This is really interesting. Can just the structure of a metal change proliferation, morphology, and gene expression in cells, right? No other ad additives at all, just the actual structure of the material itself. And that's what we wanted to see in the, the in vitro study. Um, so again, what was the objective of the study? The objective was to determine if, the, if stem cells receive kind of signals from the surface to become or go down the lineage of osteoprogenitor cells. Um, the cells were cultured for 42 days on different media, and we'll go through this, and we looked at cellular morphology, cellular proliferation, and osteoblastic differentiation. So um, this is the basis of the study. Cells were harvested from human bone marrow. And then aliquots of stem cells were placed on peak chips, machined two-dimensional titanium chips, and tie life chips. And they were placed on and analyzed at seven-day intervals from zero to 42 days. Um, when you look at the tie life technology on scanning electron microscopy, at 200 microns, you can see the trabecular nature of the metal. And if you look really closely, you can see this surface roughness um, that is you know, purported to in improve uh, osteointegration. So these are the results for our peak group. So at day one, this is the aliquot um, of cells uh, that were mesenchymal stem cells that were placed on the, the peak or plastic disc. And as you can see at day seven, it forms this relative confluent layer, but sometime between day seven and day 14, the layer starts to break and it fragments and, it, and, and the cells become detached from the actual peak itself. So there's something about um, cellular adherence to peak that early on there may be some dispersion, but later there is no uh, significant um, um, integration of the cells with the plastic itself. 
um, when we look at the scanning electron microscopy for two-dimensional titanium, we see a similar type of thing. At day seven, you see a confluent um, organization of cells, but then sometime, somewhere between day seven, day 14, day 20, the cells begin to pellet in the center. And then at day 42, um, the pellet that rem remains in the center starts to to proliferate, but everything on the side doesn't. So there's some cells that remain attached to the titanium. There's probably a few, and those are proliferating. Um, but most of the cellular attachments um, had been disengaged by day 42. And then when you look at three-dimensional titanium, and this is the tide life technology, um, you can see early elongation of the cells at day seven. So these are the cells, and you can see elongation of uh, extracellular matrix. Um, but at day 28 and day 42, the layer of cells that remains attached to the, to the metal itself is so dense that it's really impossible to distinguish the cells themselves from the extracellular matrix um, that they deposited. And this is a really interesting uh, slide that shows the scan, scanning electron microscopy after 48 hours of inoculation of the stem cells on the tie life technology. Uh, and what you can see is that um, the the set? These are the set. These dots are the cells, and these big globes are kind of the metal struts. And um, what you can see is that there is extracellular matrix already that's extending between the metal that's being excreted by these cells as early as two days after um, deposition of the cells. So there's early cell to cell communication, uh, in addition to adherence on this type of um, trabecular biomimetic metal. Um, these are slides of cytoskeleton that were tagged with, I think this was cyber green, it may have been Floydian, I think it's cyber, cyber green though, but basically um, it was the cytoskeleton or the actin was, was tagged with um, a fluorescent marker. Um, and you can see the blue dots are, as always, are nuclei. Um, and at day seven on the Thai life, you can see that there's early cytoskeleton formation. Um, and then at, as we progress from day 28 to day 42, there's increased cytoskeleton changes and there's complexity and there's remodeling. Um, and this, this remodeling and complexity is really directly proportional to cell to cell communication um, and mechanotransduction that's occurring. Um, this is really not dissimilar to kind of like a fiber optic network um, that you'd see, be, see between cells. Um, this is a, the results of the cellular proliferation part of the in vitro study. So we looked at um, how, what was the number of cells and how did those proliferate at different time points at time point zero, seven, 14, 21, 28, and 42. And what you can see is that at day 42, um, the 3D printed biomimetic titanium um, had the highest number of cellular proliferation. So there's something in the metal that is not only changing the structure of the cell at this point, not only changing the morphology of the cell and the deposition of extracellular matrix, but it's also inducing, something is inducing cellular proliferation more to an, to an extent more than traditional titanium or uh, um, peak. Um, the cellular, the calcium content of the cell culture um, was looked at as a potential predictor of biomineralization. Um, what we can see here is that the calcium content um, at day 42 may be slightly higher than the other, um, uh, the other implants. This is a little bit confusing for me because um, given the fact that there's a higher number of differentiated cells that's in the tie life sample, um, it's really hard to tell if this is truly an increased calcium content or uh, an increase that's a result to the increased number of differentiated cells. So I kind of hold a little bit of weight in this. Um, this is alkaline phosphatase activity. Alkaline phosphatase activity, this cell is normalized to, to protein content. So um, this, it takes out the, uh, um, the amount of, of cells and it's normalized to that. So it's normalized for the cell number. Um, and, and what we find is alkaline phosphatase, as everybody knows, is a membrane bound protein, which is very specific to the osteoblast and it's released during times of osteoblastic proliferation. So what does that mean for us in this? It means as we started with stem cells and this is an enzyme that's found in osteoblasts, this is kind of giving us a hint that um, these stem cells are going down an osteoblastic lineage. So this is saying, is there something on the three-dimensional titanium biomimetic structure 
that's actually driving cells from a stem cell down the osteoblastic lineage. And what we see at day 42 um, is that there is significantly more um, uh, osteoblastic differentiation uh, in, uh, in the 3D printed titanium tie life biomimetic technology compared to traditional plastic peak and two dimensional titanium. Um, so this is really interesting, right? So there is something about structure alone, not graft, um, not additional media, just the structure alone. There's something about this biomimetic structure that can change cell morphology, can induce proliferation, and may be able to drive stem cells down um, an osteoblastic lineage. Um, you know, as clinicians, like we are here in the room, the next question is, well, it's great in a test tube, but what does it mean for me? And, um, and, and does this work in vivo? Um, and that was our next question too. Um, and we looked at um, the fusion in an animal model where we used sheep. Um, and we took eight sheep that were randomly implanted at the L2, 3, and the L4, 5 levels. Okay, so there's each sheep was implanted with both cages. And I'm going to tell you kind of what's going on. The, the, what we looked at was a tie life technology cage without any bone graft at all. And we compared that to a peak cage with autologous iliac crest bone graft, right? So a peak cage with the gold standard bone graft that we have, right? That shows equivalency to um, BMP versus a tie life cage with no graft at all. No DBM, no, no other allograft, no autograft, just the cage itself. So kind of looking at how does the structure of the cage itself um, lead to in vivo fusion compared to what is considered relatively gold standard, um, at least in the 90s, I mean, at least in the, the 2000s and 2010s of peak plus autologous iliac crest bone graft. And, you know, when we look in this, in the literature, this is one of relatively few studies and uh, that I could find that actually looked at a cage without any graft. So kind of really looking at how does this structure um, change in vivo fusion conditions. And we looked at, um, we analyzed the behavior of bone contact with tie life versus peak. We looked at time points four and eight weeks. Um, the literature standard I think is eight and 16 weeks, but we looked at early osteointegration on CT scan, micro CT and histology um, at both of those time points. Unfortunately, uh, the animals underwent um, sedation, obviously, for their scans at four weeks, and one of the animals passed away. Um, so we were left with seven animals. So even though the, the, the study started with eight sheep, um, the final results were in seven. So if you see that, uh, that that's, that's kind of what happened during it. Um, a standard traditional retroperitoneal approach was uh, performed, um, and essentially an A-lift, O-lift type of inner body fusion was uh, used for the study. And again, one group was this peak cage with autologous iliac crest bone graft that was uh, obtained at the time of the surgery. And the second was the tie life cage with no bone graft at all. Um, when we look at the micro CT results of peak at eight weeks, what you can see is, this is one of the end plates here, this is another one of the end plates here. You can see that there's still some fragments of the iliac crest bone, but there's actually no um, integration of bone across the cage or around the cage. And if you look at the bottom right, um, it's, this is kind of a remarkable picture. You can actually see that there's relative osteolysis around the cage um, and really no evidence of, of, of fusion um, or even early fusion. Um, at eight weeks. Now, when you look at the tie life technology or this biomimetic technology, um, you can see that again, there's not complete fusion through the cage yet, but you can do, you do see that there is bone that's forming at already at eight weeks and starting to traverse through the cage itself. Um, and when you look at the bone 
the microstructure of the bone, um, you can see that it's actually integrating in these pores um, relatively robustly on both sides uh, of the cage. So, you know, there's, there's early spot welding, um, which can lead to early stability for patients um, that we could see already at eight weeks after, this, after the, um, uh, on the micro CT. Now, this is a remarkable slide too. This is actually a CT scan at eight weeks. Um, you can see the peak that is implanted here. Um, and you can see the tie life 3D printed technology. Again, this is peak plus iliac crest bone graft. And you can see there's relative resorption of the bone graft itself um, and osteolysis. And what you can see at, around the tie life technology is that um, there's relative robust bone formation, both through the cage, behind the cage, and ventral to the cage. So um, there's something about this technology that um, is causing you know, profoundly more bone formation than we would see with peak plus um, our gold standard allograft. Um, this is a post-mortem histologic specimen for the tie life technology. Um, and, and again, no, ever we haven't kind of looked at these since medical school, unless you read a lot of basic science journals. Um, but, you know, in kind of a brief review is this dark purple stuff that you see um, is immature woven bone. Um, this pink trabecular stuff here is um, mature bone, lamellar bone. And then this hyaline type stuff in the middle here um, is uh, cartilage formation. It's kind of that pinkish purplish um, relatively low number of nuclei in the middle is, is cartilage. Um, so what we see here is um, that in between the cage, so this is end plate up here, this is end plate down here, um, and this is in between the cage. In between the cage, we are seeing some sort of end chondral ossification. The end chondral ossification means that the you know, bone is formed through a cartilaginous precursor. Um, so in between the cage, we are seeing some early evidence of end chondral bone formation. Again, this is again without any bone graft at all that's occurring through the, the cage itself. Um, and if you look at the early Bowden studies from the 90s about how fusion occurs, we don't necessarily know 100% how biological fusion does occur. We think that it's actually a combination. It's not just intramembranous. It's not just enchondral. We think that there's a combination of both that's occurring and that it's a different process than traditional fracture healing that we study in orthopedics. Um, so what we see here is in the center of the cage, um, we see this enchondral ossification. But if you look on the cage itself, so on the surface of these trabecular pores, um, you could see this dark, purple deposition, that's immature woven bone, there's intramembranous bone formation. So bone that's forming without a cartilaginous precursor. And that's really interesting, right? So we have two types of bone formation that we're seeing um, that's stimulated just by uh, the, the, the metal and the surface itself. Um, this is just looking at things a little bit closer. Um, and you can see this purple is this immature woven bone and that this pink is the mature lamellar bone. And you can see that there's early osteointegration of immature woven bone um, and in an intram intramembranous uh, type of formation on the cage itself. Now, when we look at peak, um, it's a stark difference, right? This is a really nice picture because you can see that now you don't see really any bone formation around the peak itself. You actually see relative area of maybe apoptosis um, or fibrous formation. Um, you see this kind of uh, almost shielding of bone formation and where the um, graft was placed at eight weeks, you can see that there's um, osteolysis essentially of the iliac crest bone graft that was placed uh, between the, the cage and you know some some other in vitro studies with peak have been shown that uh, peak itself can induce uh, mesenchymal stem cell apoptosis and that may be part of what we're seeing here again that's just speculation. Um, we wanted to look at it quantitatively, so we did uh, a quantitative histologic analysis of this, where we um, subtracted uh, the inner body cage out in yellow here, uh, and the surrounding tissues were measured, discerning those of cartilage versus 
um, bone. And what we found was that um, there was significantly more bone and cartilage in the 3D printed titanium without graft as there was in the peak plus allograft. And it was significant uh, 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 in both the cartilage and the, and the bone um, subgroups. Um, the next thing we looked at was um, bone implant contact, um, which I think is important for early osteointegration, kind of this spot welding to the cage to get early stability. Um, and what we found is that, you know, as you could see in the peak cage, there was really no bone implant contact at all, uh, but there was significantly more in the 3D printed uh, biomimetic titanium. Hey, Dr. Um, Lamar, so kind of, um, yes. close, how much longer do you take approximately? About two, maybe a minute or two. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, in conclusion, I think that Thai life shows a, a much faster and enhanced osteointegration when compared to peak plus autologous iliac crest bone graft, even at four weeks. This leads to early stability, and this is where we started from. What leads to fusion? Stability, size of implant, delivery of graft. Um, Thai life allows bone graft through the cage around the cage while peak shows osteolysis uh, when even using autologous iliac bone graft. So kind of what's the take home message for all this? Well, this is really comprehensive, right? So we looked at in vitro and in vivo for biomimetic titanium. When you mimic trabecular bone structure in terms of modulus, porosity, and roughness, um, this is like, there is likely things that are going on in terms of cellular proliferation, changes in morphology, differentiation into osteoblast and early integration. Um, and I think what this is leading us to is, uh, can we eventually get to this technology becomes so good that bone graft and biologics are not necessary? Um, uh, this is just kind of disclosures where this was presented and where it is accepted. Um, and, I, and I thank you guys for, for inviting us and to allow us to talk to you about this technology. So great, Dr. Lorada. Thank you so much. And uh, really cool to hear your basic sciences research. I'm glad that there's new efforts at improving the biomaterials. Now, all honestly, what is the advantage in a, a two-sentence response, or so two or three-sentence response, of this material over allograft, structural allograft? Structural allograft is appropriate uh, graft bed preparation and biomechanical neutralization seems to work pretty well. So why would we use a complex titanium over a proven uh, biologic material? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and uh, I'm glad, and I hope none of your fellows get that question asked to them on their boards either. Um, that was something that I thought when I was taking my boards is, what if the examiners tell me, uh, why are you using cages and not allograft? And I don't think we exactly know the answer yet, um, but we, are think, we do think that maybe again, just like these studies, that there is something about this biomimetic metal with titanium specifically that may be inducing different changes. Um, but we would have to do, for us to know that, we have to do kind of head-to-head -head studies of allograft versus um, titanium. In short, two sentences, I use, so I, I trained with Dan Rue at Columbia. I use allograft for ACDFs, right? So I believe in that technology. I still think it's a great technology. And I think that a lot of times we have to be careful with industry is industry changes how we practice kind of more than the basic science does. But I don't think there's anything wrong with allograft at all. Great. So then the uh, second question, my second and last question, we have to unfortunately come to a close is, uh, in some of the earlier cases we showed, we demonstrated the significant problems of imaging titanium bone interfaces and concluding if there's a true fusion or what I've labeled a metallusion, something that seems to be okay, but we're not quite sure. And only over time we see increasing subsidence with secondary uh, phenomena like hardware failure in one case. So how can we actually truly identify fusion clinically <clears throat> with imaging tests, et cetera, in the future with these more biologically interactive uh, materials? Right, so, you know, it's, and, and that's tough, right? So um, uh, I, when I look for fusion on cages, uh, when we're using cages, and this is something that uh, we wrote a paper on at, out of Columbia as well, um, you know, there's fusion through the cage and there's fusion around the cage. Um, I, I take much less, um, uh, I, I think that the fusion around the cage is actually more important than the fusion through the cage. And especially when you look at ACDFs and things like that, um, th that's usually where you can kind of dis see distinct fusion. The problem with metal, like, you're set, like you mentioned, is that they're scattered. 
these new technologies of biomimetic metal should actually improve our ability to assess fusion on CT scan because there's much less scatter than there is in regular titanium. So hopefully um, we can see and assess fusion around the cage and through the cage better because it has a less dense structure. Now, that being said, like we, like we showed in this, how much fusion is really needed? Can you just spot weld to the cage in itself? And is that fine, right? And if you look back at uh, Jeffrey Fishgrun studies, you know, with uninstrumented fusion, 45% of uninstrumented fusions that went on to non-union were asymptomatic, right? So um, I think when we talk about that, what's the effect of spot welding, like you see with kind of SI fusion and SI bone, is that enough? Um, or does robust around the cage fusion need to be uh, uh, achieved in every patient? And I think that's still to be determined. I know you're not a corporate spokesperson. Uh, we appreciate Spine Arts' uh, support of your lecture today. But um, do you anticipate there being a premium on this kind of a biomimetic titanium? Or is this something that can be uh, kind of offered in a cost competitive fashion towards conventional uh, currently available implants? Um, I can tell you, I can only tell you my experiences at my institutions, which is one is an academic institution. And then I, I, I work at three different private hospitals as well as a surgery center. Um, the, the new biomimetic technology comes in at a higher price point um, in most of those systems than the other ones. Okay. Yeah, so uh, this is obviously very compelling, and I really appreciate the beautiful slides you showed and uh, clearly developing something that can mimic uh, nature better and induce bone healing without complex humoral factors and logic responses is desirable. Uh, I see a clear role for a solid structural grafts uh, beyond allograft in the future. So I, I really appreciate on behalf of our viewership from around the globe, um, you educating us about this and showing and sharing your information. Thank you guys, have a good day. So thank you, Dr. Lerada, and thank you for all of our viewers today. And with this, we'll conclude today's STED Talk. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. Good job. I'm glad you showed that case. Yes. Yeah, so I, 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 yeah. I think that it, that's.